Good morning again. Today we're talking about part three of the first angel's message. We're looking at several different aspects of these messages in Revelation chapter 14. And today we're going to be talking about the hour of his judgment. We're studying about the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12. Uh, three successive angels proclaiming messages that end up running concur- concurrently. Um, and we've been specifically looking the last two weeks at the first angel's message. We looked at the historical background, the history of the first giving of the first angel's message. Last week we were talking about the pillars of our faith, how the pillars, dynamic pillars of our Christian and Advent experience really uh, are contained within the three angels' messages and how important they are. And today we want to look specifically in Revelation 14.7, if you'd like to turn there with me, please. And this first angel, whose message is to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, says with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. The hour of His judgment is come. And this is what we want to look at today, some about the hour of His judgment. I'd like to, first of all, just give you a little bit of the rationale behind the need for these three angels' messages. When God started His church, according to Matthew chapter 16, He built it and He founded it upon the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. Is that right? Amen. That's exactly what He said. And we realize that during the time of the apostles, the church remained relatively pure. But even during that time, the Apostle Paul could write in 2 Thessalonians that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There was beginning to creep in the church errors and problems that were going to cause people to be lost, to become uh, the, the prey of Satan, as it were. And the Bible understood, or Jesus understood, of course, that this was going to happen, knowing the future. He knew what was going to happen, and he prophesied in the Scripture in several places, in Daniel and also in Revelation, that there would be a time period, a time period of 1260 years, of which there would be a great darkness, spiritual darkness, in this world because of the apostasy within this church. And What happened was, we know that that history tells us that the church at Rome began to take a preeminence. And after a while, the, the, the individual who was the bishop of Rome became known as the Pope, and that the papal church tried to supplant the true Christian church. And from 538 A.D. until 1798, the papal church basically was ruling Europe. And this has been historically called the Dark Ages. It was an age when darkness prevailed, but God wanted to bring people out of that darkness. And 500 years and a few weeks ago, an Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the church door at Wittenberg and started a revolution And we called it, it was known at that time as the Protestant Reformation. It wasn't the Protestant Reformation. (laughs) It was the Protestant Reformation. In fact, to the Catholics, it was a revolution. And it was. It was revolutionary to them, although it shouldn't have been because it was founded first and foremost in the Scriptures. And men like Martin Luther... John Wycliffe, who actually preceded Luther, um, and others began to raise up the torch of truth and to hold it brightly. Men like John Wesley later came on the scene. Um, There was a Baptist minister by the name of William Miller who began to preach in America. But what happened was the protesters quit protesting. And they began, began to be more and more assimilated back into Romish ways. If not members of the Roman Church, if not members of the Catholic Church, they became more and more like Catholics and they, be, they quit protesting. And the distinctions that made them different, the, the, the narrowness of that distinction became more and more close all the time. And so God in His mercy to humanity, in His desire that everyone hear the truth, 
had to raise up another movement. He looked among all the Protestant churches that had become Protestant churches, looking for someone to carry his message, someone that would say that the hour of his judgment has come, and it's time to worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water, a direct call to the worship of the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, and he could find no one. But he used a man like William Miller and other men like William Miller to sound a message to continue, if you please, and finish the Reformation. To continue protesting, to continue to teach the truth, and then to develop the truth, and especially the last day truths about the judgment in a way that they had never been brought up before. And it's interesting, if you look historically... You look historically through Christianity. You don't find anyone preaching this message of the three angels prior to about 1833. They weren't doing it. And why, you might ask. It wasn't, wasn't it part of the Bible? Of course it was part of the Bible. But you see, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, it says that the hour of his judgment is come. The Apostle Paul, when he was preaching, he preached about a judgment to come, a judgment that was future. That judgment had not begun, had not begun in the day of Paul. But now, coming into the middle of the 19th century, it is now time for the hour of his judgment to come. And there were specific prophecies relating to the judgment that showed that something important was going to transpire in heaven around the middle of the 19th century. And that is the hour of his judgment. And that's what we're going to look at today, this prophecy about the hour of his judgment and how it fits in to us as a people and our goal and our mission. Now, William Miller, he was a sincere man who understood that there was a prophecy in Daniel 8, 14. That prophecy said, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And he, fort- he saw that this Prophecy foretold a time of judgment. And though Miller did not correctly see the exact event that was to take place with the fulfillment of this prophecy, he knew that it represented some form of judgment. And this verse, Daniel 8, 14, that says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, is at the very core of Adventism. Seventh-day Adventists, have used a term called the investigative judgment to describe part of what is going on in this verse. Now, before we go on, I just want you to understand that this is a teaching that is not well received. It's not well loved by most of Christianity. But I wanted to share with you a thought, and this is taken from Special Testimonies on Education on page 11 by Ellen White. A statement that she wrote, and if you'll think about it, it's so true. It says, The most learned in the world, world's lore, who are not watching to hear what God says in His Word and opening their hearts to receive that Word and give it to others are not representatives of His. It is not the great and learned men of the earth, kings and nobles, who receive the truth unto eternal life, though it be brought to them. And you remember Jesus said that there won't be many great men, not many high men, not many mighty men that are going to receive the truth. And this has been the way it has always been. Now, the Judgment Hour doctrine, as I mentioned, has not been well received outside of Adventism. In 1956, a minister by the name of Donald Barnhouse was publishing a magazine entitled Eternity. It was one of the larger religious publications in our country at the time. He was a very well-known minister in his day. Uh, I wouldn't put him on the level, say, well, as well known as someone like Billy Graham, but clearly someone very well known in his time and very well respected. And here's what he said about this concept of an investigative judgment. He says it, referring to the investigative judgment, is to my mind nothing more than a human face-saving idea. We personally do not believe that there is even a suspicion of a verse in Scripture to sustain such a peculiar position, and we further believe that any effort to establish it is still flat and unprofitable. Now, what did Barnhouse mean here when he said it was a face-saving idea? 
That's because William Miller and others were preaching that Jesus was going to come in 1844. And they were basing that date upon the prophecy in Daniel 8.14 that we're going to look at today. And they believed that the sanctuary to be cleansed was the earth. And that Jesus was going to come back in 1844 and cleanse the earth by fire and take to heaven those who were faithful. But of course in 1844 this didn't happen. Specifically, they understood the date to be October 22, 1844. And they were right about the date. The date prophetically was correct, but the event was wrong. And so they had to come to grips with what had happened at that time and try to understand what did, where did we get it wrong? You know, what, what went wrong? And Barnhouse says that the answer they came up with the judgment in heaven, the investigative judgment, the concept of the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven was simply a face-saving idea. And he saw in it not a, not, nothing that you could find a, a scriptural evidence in any way. There wasn't a shred of truth in it. And he says in any attempts to establish it are, as he said, stale, flat, and unprofitable. Well, I... Uh, you may remember that a few years ago, a couple years ago, I had a Sabbath school class and we made some video presentations or I recorded the presentations. One was on the investigative judgment, the other was on the Day of Atonement. And someone recently saw my uh, video on the investigative judgment that I posted and he wrote this comment on it. I thought you'd find it interesting. His name is Michael Heathman. I'm sure he doesn't mind me stating this because he publicly put it on the YouTube page. And he says, just another Adventist cult member, referring to me, embarrassing himself, attempting to prop up a demonic prophet and his infallible interpreter. This mutt believes Jesus is still making an atonement. Notice how he continually reads from the great controversy. A rag written by a thief and liar, a lunatic craving attention. Jesus will look upon this Pharisee, speaking about me, and saying, depart from me, I never knew you. Um, I've never really read in the Word of God where Christians are to write and speak about other people quite like that, but this is the way this person does. But remember this, that by beholding, you become changed. Right? 2 Corinthians 3.17 We all with open face beholding, I'm sorry, verse 18, beholding as a glass the glory of the Lord are changed in the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And friends, the God that you love, worship, and adore, the God that you behold is the kind of person you're going to be changed into. It makes me question what kind of a God this person <laughs> worships. But nevertheless, I, I point this out to illustrate that this is not a popular, well-received message. Now, I did make a, a video on that, and this is the first one was on the investigative judgment, and that actually, and I'll post, these slides will be posted if you want the reference for that video, it's on our website, and then we followed it up with one on the investigative judgment that we're going to be talking about also today. But I want you to understand, friends, that this concept is a biblical concept, and we're just going to be looking at the Bible, only on what the Bible says about today. We won't be reading from Great Controversy, we could, the book, The Great Controversy. And by the way, if you really want the best understanding of this, probably is not my sermon. If you'll just simply read those five or six chapters in The Great Controversy that specifically deal with this, you'll get the clearest presentation ever. And it's a presentation that's based in the Bible. But nevertheless, I'm going to try today to perhaps approach it again. Now, in Daniel 8.14, it said, In the 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And we know that there was an earthly tabernacle. God had instructed Moses to build a tabernacle in the wilderness. It was composed of two parts, a holy place uh, and then a most holy place. In the holy place, there was a table of showbread. Uh, and by the way, which side was the table of showbread on? The north. <clears throat> the north? Okay. Yeah. And the candlesticks were on the south? south? And the altar, the uh, golden altar was on the west side. And then inside there was a veil, and between the veil there was the Ark of the Covenant and uh, in the most holy place. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But in this system, there was a high priest, 
beginning with Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest. And then there were many other priests eventually. Uh, his sons were made priests. And then later many priests were uh, chosen from the tribe of Levi. But all of this was a type. It was symbols prefiguring something, talking about a reality in heaven. Because these services, Paul says in Hebrews, could not make the comer thereto perfect. They couldn't cleanse sin of themselves. He says the blood of bulls and goats that this service, this, this tabernacle and the services of it require. He says they could not. They could not bring about the forgiveness of sin. And so there, there, there had to be a purpose though for all these things. And the great purpose was to be a lesson book to us about a reality that they were simply a type of. Now let's turn to Hebrews chapter 3 in our Bibles. And verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, consider the apostle and what else? The high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So in heaven, in the heavenly sanctuary, we'll see text about it in just a minute, there's a high priest, and that high priest is who? It's Jesus Christ, isn't it? Hebrews chapter 8 now, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, Now are the things which we have spoken, this is the sum, or the summation. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Who is that high priest according to Hebrews 3.1? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Verse 2, he says, He is a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. And so we see here that there's a tabernacle that God pitched. It's not this tabernacle that we're seeing here on the slide. It's something in heaven that this was a representation of. Now, who knows or who remembers what Romans 6.23 says? Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a need that each and every one of us has, because the wages of sin is death. And the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all need salvation. Now, in Hebrews 9.22, it says, and almost all things, Hebrews 9.22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. God's law is a law of life, friends. It is high, it is holy. And because it is a law of life, life must be given to redeem those who have been, who have transgressed that law. In Leviticus 17 and verse 11, he's explaining why sacrifices had to be made. Why was the blood shed and brought to the altar? And he says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. There's no forgiveness. There's no remission without the shedding of blood. Blood represents the life. Now, in Psalm 77, 13, a text I think you know. I hope you know. Psalm 77, 13 says, Thy way, O God, I'm listening, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? God's way is in the sanctuary. His salvation, the way He has chosen to redeem man, is centered in the sanctuary. Now, this sanctuary that God told Moses to make, in fact, let's just notice in Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9, he says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So God's purpose was to have this sanctuary so he could dwell among them. But it wasn't simply just so that God could have a house, you know, or a dorm room, or an apartment, some place to abide in that sense. In verse 9 he says, According to all that I shew thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the in instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. He says, I'm showing you a pattern or a blueprint. You're going to make 
this tabernacle like this blueprint. But this blueprint was a type of the blueprint of the sanctuary in heaven. And according to Isaiah 59 verse 2, sin separates you from God. Is that right? Sin brings separation. And so the point of having the tabernacle so that God could dwell among them wasn't simply just to give him a place to abide, but so that he would have a way to remove sin from them so that he could then abide with them. Does that make sense? Is that reasonable? It's biblical. Now again, the sanctuary that God told Moses to make, which was a pattern of something in heaven, had two apartments. There was a holy place, and then a most holy place. On a daily basis, the, the priests ministered in the holy place. But only once a year could they minister in the most holy place. In fact, in Hebrews, going back to Hebrews chapter 9, Paul gives a summation, a summation of these services. And, and there were several. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlesticks and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Now, just, just pause here, verse 2, for a minute. But he, he's, he's using terminology that we might not quickly be familiar with. But he says that this first portion, there was a tabernacle made, but he says the first, the first what? The first portion or the first part of it had a, a, the table of showbread. He said it had this, this the... the um, I'm sorry, the candlesticks and the showbread, and, and, and he says this is called the sanctuary. And that's, that, that word translated sanctuary there is simply, it's the holy. It's from a Greek word meaning holy. Verse 3, And after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, or the most holy. Now notice he says something, he calls it the second um, veil, the second veil. And he says that, that this is, he calls this, he says, and after the second veil, the tabernacle was called the holiest of all. That's the second veil because there was also what? A first veil, right? Right, right over here there was another veil that, uh, you know, let the way into the second part. So, so keep that in mind, especially when you read Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9, uh, 6, 19 and 20 at other times. We won't go into that today. But there, there were two services. Okay, let's keep on reading. Verse 4 now. It says, which had the golden censer, the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And then verse 5. And over it the cherubim of glory shattering the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always, or as the margin says, daily into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the services of God. So when it says they went into the first tabernacle, Tabernacle, what it means is they went into the first apartment of this overall large tent. And they went in there daily on a regular basis performing the services of God. The sin offering would be brought here, the daily sin offering. But then he says in verse 7, But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. So into the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, the high priest went once a year. And this was on what is called the Day of Atonement. Atonement. The Day of Atonement. Now let's look at just a couple of the verses from um, the book of Leviticus that speaks about the daily service and speaks about the yearly. In Leviticus chapter 4, there, there are actually four different sin offerings mentioned in Leviticus 4, but the one we'd be most interested in is the one for the common person like us. And there's actually two different ways in that that was performed, but in each case, there was a result that was similar. Mm -hmm. And in verse 31, he says, And he shall take away all the fat thereof, as the fat is taken away from off of the sacrifice of peace offerings. That was the fat off of the, the offering that was to be made. Uh, one of the ki a kid of a goat, a female without blemish, it says. And he says, And the priest shall burn upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord, and the priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. There was an atonement made, it says, an atonement made through this kind of offering. And this was something that happened day by day. The priests would actually eat a part of this flesh, and then as they would minister into the first apartment of the sanctuary, they would thereby, by, in, in a symbolic way, transfer that sin from, um, from the sinner to themselves to the most uh, to the holy place 
But now in Leviticus 16, there's depicted the Day of Atonement service. And I would encourage you to read and study through the whole chapter, understand the process. It's too long for us to discuss today in relationship to the other things we have to discuss. But this was the most important day on the, on the Hebrew calendar of any year. This was the day of all days. This was, it, it's, it refers to in Leviticus 23 as the atonement of all atonements. Because there were several different things that, that were called atonements. But this was the most important one. It was considered a day of judgment. This day of atonement, when the sanctuary was to be cleansed of its sins, was considered a day of judgment. But notice the, the, the effect of what happens on this day in verse 30. Leviticus 16, verse 30. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you, to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And so we have here in this daily and in this yearly service, we have the process of the plan of salvation revealed. We have a forgiveness and we have a cleansing. We have a justification, we have a sanctification. You see, we have uh, the imputed righteousness of Christ and we have the imparted righteousness of Christ. So that the individual can not only be forgiven of sin, they can not only uh, have deliverance from the penalty of sin, but they can have deliverance from the power of sin as well. Does that make sense? That's what God wants for us. He doesn't want us just to continue to live in sin, does He? No, no. Now, there is a temple in heaven that is the real or the antitype of the type that God told Moses to make. And we read about this in several places in the New Testament. I'm just going to show you a few. One of them is in Revelation chapter 11. So let's go back to Revelation John is in vision, and he says here in verse 19, he sees something. He says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and or an earthquake in great hell. Now notice he says that there's a temple in heaven. I've heard people, even supposedly learned ministers, who said, Well, there really is no temple in heaven. All of heaven is a temple. All of heaven is a sanctuary. But that's not what the verse says, right? What we want to know is what the Bible says. What does the verse say? It says that there's a temple of God, and that temple was opened in heaven. It's not heaven itself. It's something in heaven. But something that he sees in that temple is called the Ark of the Covenant. And was there an Ark of the Covenant in the earthly sanctuary? There certainly was, wasn't there? And it was in the, what we call the most holy place or the holiest of all, the holies of holies. But that's not all the Bible speaks about. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24, here Paul says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And the place he's going to appear in heaven is in that temple. Because he's not went into a holy place made with hands. He's made it, went into a holy place that's been made by God. Verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look to him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Friends, there's something that's happening in heaven right now. Something that Jesus is doing right now that is preparing people so that when he comes back the second time, He's going to greet a people without sin. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul asks a question. He says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The ultimate goal of God is to cleanse our soul temples. And the only way the temple in heaven can be cleansed is if our soul temples are cleansed there. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus speaking here, to the church of Sardis says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Friends, the promise is to those who overcome, the one with whom sin is going to be removed from. As Christ does this work of judgment and cleansing the sanctuary, only the names of those who have professed Jesus will come up in this judgment, and only those who have overcome will remain in the book of life. 
Now, as I mentioned in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, there is something that uh, Ellen White calls the longest time prophecy of the Bible. On the 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, speaking about 2,300 days here, or we're going to call this 2,300 years, and we're going to have a chart, and we're going to start filling this chart in, this prophetic chart. We're going to be looking at it and seeing where we come to and what fits where. Now, the text says under 2,300 days, but the, the, uh, the Hebrew actually says under 2,300 evening and mornings. Mm -hmm. 2,300 evening and mornings, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So why do we translate that days? Because in the Hebrew economy, friends, an evening and a morning make a day. An evening and morning make a day. And let me just take you back, if we could, to Genesis chapter 1. And just, for instance, in verse 5, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Verse 8, And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So if you have 2,300 evening and mornings, you have 2,300 days. But you say, Brother Allen, why on your chart do you say 2,300 years? It doesn't say that in the text, right? So why do we have that? It's because in Bible prophecy that is symbolic, symbolic Bible prophecy, a day is symbolic of a year of time. There are certain symbols used in the Bible that we know don't represent literal things. For instance, in Revelation 12, we, we read there about this dragon. And in Revelation 13, about this beast that has, um, is composed of four different animals. It has the, um, the, the body of a leopard. It has the mouth of a lion. It has the feet of the bear. It has ten horns upon it. We know that there's no creature like this in existence. In Daniel chapter 7, there are depicted beasts. Uh, a lion with wings. A leopard that has four heads and four wings. And we know that Beasts like these don't exist in nature, but they represent something. And as we study on, we're going to see what those things, some of those things represent. The Bible tells us what they represent. The Bible says this is a symbol, and here's the interpretation. And the Bible does this also with this concept of time. When you're, when you're looking at symbolic Bible prophecy, one day of prophetic time equals a year of literal time. And I'm just going to give you a couple verses and, and, and uh, parts to consider on this, and, and we will look at it in detail later. In uh, Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, uh, concerning something that God had told Ezekiel, he says, When thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have pointed thee each, what? Day for a year. Each day for a year. And Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34, he says, And after the number of the days in which ye searched the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Or as the margin says, ye shall know the altering of my purpose. God originally wanted to take the children of Israel right into the promised land, didn't he? And he sent spies out, and they were out for forty days. And when they came back, they brought back a bad report, an evil, lying report. And, and the people rebelled. They said, we, we can't do this. We're going to not go along with God's plan. And God says, I'm going to send you into the wilderness now for 40 years, each day for a year. In Leviticus chapter 25, there is, a, um, there, there is instruction there um, on having sabbatical years and how they were to count these years. And in, the, in verse, um, verse 8, it speaks about a jubilee cycle. And you can see that God is making a comparison of a day for a year. And interestingly, um, even if you go to a non-biblical source, if you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, and, and maybe if we have time next week, we'll look at this. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they actually write about a prophecy concerning this jubilee time and when they expect the Messiah to come, the Essians. About 200 B.C., right? But Brother Bob is familiar with these people a little bit, and he knows what they've written. And, and, uh, and there they were calculating this 
based upon the principle that a day in Bible prophecy equaled a year in literal time. And so even many hundreds of years before the time of Christ, this principle was understood by people. And then finally, there's simply the pragmatic test. And as we look at this prophecy next week in detail, we're going to see how in, in, in a very pragmatic way, it just works out. And nothing else fits but to do this. And when you use this principle, it all fits and comes together in a, in a nice package. I think that's probably where we should stop today because to go any further is going to take a while. And I don't want to belabor this too much. But I want you to understand this now, friends, and, and, and we're going to wrap up and have closing song and prayer in just a minute. But before I do that, I, want to, I just want to bind this together, if I can, for just a minute, okay? After the death of Jesus, after the death of Jesus, the apostles, they tarried first in Jerusalem, Right? Because Jesus told them to do that. Until they be endued with power from on high. And he says, you'll be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the other most parts of the earth. And the Holy Spirit fell upon those disciples during the day of Pentecost. And then persecution came into the church, uh, helped to nudge some of them out that weren't going otherwise. And the, and the message was going to the whole world at that time. But... Gradually, corruption came in to the, to the people of God, and, and, a, and a new force took over. The mystery of iniquity began to work, and the, and the church lost its pureness. And, and it had to go underground. It went into hiding. It actually went into hiding, according to Revelation chapter 12. And it stayed in hiding for 1,260 years. But sometime after that period, after 1798, God was going to bring his church out of hiding. And he was going to set signs and wonders in the heaven to show that, as we mentioned two weeks ago. The Lisbon earthquake, the falling of the stars, the dark day, all these things, these great historical events happened just before the fulfillment of this prophecy of 2300 years in Daniel 8.14. And God was saying that the judgment's going to happen and to get you ready, because I want you to be ready, I have to have a sanctuary so I might dwell with my people. And the point of the sanctuary, again, is not to give God an apartment or a, a condo to live in. The point is to remove sin from his people because sin is what separates us from God so that we could be at one with him. That there could be this harmony, harmony with God no matter where we are at. In his universe, his whole universe is going to have harmony. There's this, uh, there's this theory in quantum mechanics called entanglement. And Tangman says that if I have two electrons, for instance, and they're vibrating in frequency, and these electrons have become entangled, if I start to separate them, it seems as if there is an invisible umbilical cord attaching these two to each other. And so as this one vibrates, this one vibrates the exact same way. But if I was to somehow separate these electrons from one end of the universe to the other, and I do something that affects this electron over here, do you know what happens over here? It happens in the exact same thing. In the exact same time. But you say light can't travel that fast to send the communication, but somehow something happens. We don't understand this yet, but we know it happens. right? And these two electrons are going to be in harmony no matter where they're at. But God wants to make you in harmony with him no matter where you're at, whether you're here on this earth right now or in heaven. He's not going to have to wait till Jesus comes a second time to miraculously change your nature, to put you in harmony with Him, and to change your vile nature so that you want to serve Him suddenly when you didn't want to serve Him before. You know, predestination, Calvinism teaches a doctrine, something like that, only that instead of at the second coming of Christ, it's going to happen at your death or at some other point in time. You're going to come mysteriously into harmony with God without even understanding it because you've been predestined. You've been one of the chosen elect. But friends, that's hogwash, as we say here in West Virginia. That's wrong. The truth is, God has told us each to choose you this day whom you'll serve. He has taught us that we may make a choice to whom you choose to serve. His servants you are. Whether sin unto righteousness, I'm sorry, sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. And God wants us to serve Him. And through this process that we call the investigative judgment, through this work of final atonement, God is going to bring every one of his people who wants to be in harmony with him into perfect, 
final, complete harmony with Him so that we will never choose to sin again. We will never want to sin again. I was talking with someone last night and he was telling me about eating something. What was that that you said you didn't ever want again after that, Brother Wally? I'm sorry. You, you, you were talking about eating something and you ate it and you got sick and you never wanted oh, it. Ever. Oh, the blue cheese dressing. The blue cheese oh. dressing. <laughs> he ate this blue cheese dressing and got so sick that he never, ever has tasted it again. Never wanted to taste it again because the taste was so bad. That taste is still in his mouth, as it, it were. Makes me sick to think about it. Makes him sick even to think about it. And friends, that's the way God wants sin to be with us. He wants it to be so sickening to us that the taste of sin that we've experienced and now that we've known the goodness of redemption, we never want it again. And even the thought of it becomes revolting to us. And that's what Christ is doing now for us, friends. That's the ultimately what He's doing now for us. He's purging our consciousness from dead works to serve the living God. And this prophecy is going to help us to understand the relevance of this and how important it is and how we are living in this time right now. And it's biblical. It's biblical it's biblical. And so it's my prayer, friends, that you'll be back with us next week as we continue this study. And don't, don't, don't dare miss it. Well, good morning to each one of you again. God is good, isn't he? Amen. We've been speaking here concerning the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, verses 6 through uh, 12 the last few weeks and last week we began part three of the three angels messages which was on the 2300 day prophecy and the hour of God's judgment and did we finish that study no, no hardly got started on it really but we're going to try try to study so this is part three three b maybe three uh, b if you want to call it that whatever but we're going to be looking at a a prophecy in the bible now as we continue from where we were last week that is, in, in reality, the longest time prophecy in the Bible. At least many people think it's the longest time prophecy in the Bible. I certainly do. And this prophecy has a direct bearing on a last day message that's to be given. In Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, uh, John in Revelation sees an angel flying in the midst of heaven, and he says he has the everlasting gospel to preach to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of his judgment is come. And remember the Apostle Paul, when he was preaching, um, he spoke about a judgment to come. A judgment that in his day was future. But now we find in Revelation chapter 14 a message that, was, that historically was beginning to be preached around 1831. William Miller and some other uh, Americans and, and different people over the world, Joseph Wolfe and others, were preaching about a, a judgment message, a message that the world was going to end. They thought in 1844. In fact, they came to the conclusion it was going to end in October 22 of 1844. And they based it upon a prophecy in the book of Daniel. Now, obviously, the world didn't end in 1844. Something else happened. But as we study through the Bible, we're going to find that they were dead on correct concerning the timing of this prophecy. And we're going to show from the Bible how this works out and the historical fulfillment of it. But we're also going to understand, hopefully a little better, the significance of what it means about the, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the hour of God's judgment. Because in Daniel 8, 14, uh, Daniel, there he heard the angel say, Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And we were studying some also in the last few weeks about the Hebrew tabernacle. And this was this tabernacle was a type or a symbol of, of a reality in heaven. And that the ritual and all the services there performed, they themselves could not make the one who brought the sacrifices perfect concerning his conscience or his mind. They were simply lessons to help them to exercise faith in what all these symbols and, and sacrifices represented. They represented Jesus. They represented Jesus, his death, and his uh, administration in heaven for us as our high priest. Now, in this prophecy in Daniel 8, 14, he says, Under 2,300, what? Days. days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But you know, that's not that many years, <coughs> is it? And so we say, well, how does that fit? Because 
if we're talking about the time of Daniel and what all this is going to fit into and how does it play about, we need to understand a little better how this, this works. But there's a principle of an understanding and interpreting Bible prophecy we want to look at a little bit as we begin today. And that principle is that in symbolic Bible prophecy, a day of prophecy represents a year of literal time. And I don't say that based upon a whim of mine or just what someone else has told me, but we're going to see that the Bible promotes this idea. And I think we looked at a couple verses or made mention of a couple things last week, but I just want to review those quickly. And one of the texts that we want to look at is in Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6. And he says, And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have pointed thee each day for a what? Yeah. Each day for a year. In Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34, he says, After the number of the days in which ye searched the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Or as the margin interestingly says, ye shall know the altering of my purpose. God has a sovereign will, friends, doesn't he? But sometimes God, because of our disobedience, has an altering of his purpose. It was God's purpose, friends, to take the children of Israel, we might say directly from Egypt into the promised land. It wasn't his desire to have them wandering 40 years in the wilderness, but it was because of their rebellion and disobedience, God says there will be an altering of my purpose. And so for each day that the spies went out and searched out the land, he says, I'm going to make that symbolic of a year each day for a year, that you're going to stand in the wilderness. And they spent 40 years in the wilderness because of that. In Leviticus chapter 25, and we're going to read the first eight verses. And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speaking unto the children of Israel, and saying to them, When you come to the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meet for you, for thee and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be meet. Now, notice he speaks about that they were going to have a, what we call sometimes a sabbatical year. Now, we know that in, in the creation week, in the creation week, God created the heaven and the earth in how many days? Six. Six days. Now, those were literal days. Those were literal, what we call 24-hour periods. Mm -hmm. And he rested on then the seventh day or the day after he finished creating. And he blessed and honored that seventh-day Sabbath. And that was a seven-day period that we today call a week. That is the origin of the week. We know why we have a year constituted by about 365 days. It's because that's how long it takes the earth, which is spherical, to go around a spherical sun. That's, that's the truth. <laughs> takes 365 revolutions of the earth. Because see, a revolution of the earth constitutes a day and a night. You know, day and night, evening and morning makes a whole day. And so that's something that we astronomically can observe. The year is something we astronomically can observe. And the month is basically determined by the moon. That's true. You know, a month is about the time it takes the moon to go around the earth. But what is it in astronomy that we can look at that determines a week? There is. There's nothing. Zero, friends. The week is determined solely by the Word of God. Amen. And the very fact that, that the whole world uses basically the same system a week is an indication that a knowledge of God, a knowledge of, of creation and the flood and, and historical things from the Bible were known through antiquity by many, many people. Okay. But now he says to the children of Israel, when you go into this land I'm going to give you, you can work the land for six years, but then it rests a Sabbath, and that Sabbath will be a year. 
And so he's making a parallel between a day and a year here. And this was called, uh, in fact, in verse 8, he says, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. And so he's talking, he's now going to introduce something called a jubilee cycle. And he says, so you have this week, this, this week of years. And if you have seven of those, seven times seven is 49. And when you finish that, then you're going to enter into something called a jubilee, a special time. Now, interestingly, also, there, there are some fragments of manuscripts that we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. Everybody's heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were discovered soon after World War II in, in, in Israel. A shepherd boy was tending some sheep, and he happened to throw a rock into an opening that looked like a cave, and he heard a sound of like a piece of pottery breaking. Oh, huh, might be something in there. We'll go check this out. And so they found these, these pieces of pottery, basically, that had scrolls inside of them. And these scrolls had been there for almost over two millennia, some of them. They were quite old. And because it was near the Dead Sea, they were called the Dead Sea Scrolls. But there's a particular uh, scroll. It was found in, uh, in the area of what they call Qumran. And it's in the 11th cave. And it's called the, the Melchizedek Scroll. And... That part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I'll discuss it a little bit later, but in this Dead Sea Scroll, they talk about the Jubilee, they talk about the pro a prophecy of Daniel, and the only way that they can come to the calculation that they do in it is by taking the assumption that a day in prophecy equals a year in time. And so this concept that a day, is, a, a, a day of Bible prophecy is symbolic for a year of literal time, it's not a Seventh-day Adventist idea, and it's not a, a Johnny-come-lately idea. It's something that people have known and understood for a long time. And then I'd like to say, fifthly, in, in support of the year-day principle, that the pragmatic test can be uh, called upon. And the fact is that when you use this principle, everything works out. And if you don't use it, things don't work out. Things don't make sense. So what we have here on our screen right now is a, um, just a very simple graph uh, a timeline with 2,300 days arching over it. We don't have a beginning time or an ending time yet, but we then have the text Daniel 8.14 on it, and the 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But then we have some understanding of the year-day principle. We have Ezekiel 4.6, uh, Numbers 14.34, Leviticus 25.1-8, through 8, uh, the Qumran scroll reference, and then, of course, as I mentioned, the pragmatic text works to this. Now, this prophecy of 2300 days is part of a prophecy involving time from the book of Daniel. Uh, as we study the prophetic book of Daniel, we're going to find that there are prophecies in it, not only Daniel 8, 14, but other prophecies that take us from that point until the end of time. And I want to begin in chapter 8 because that's where this prophecy is found in chapter 8 of Daniel. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. Now it's important that we notice that, you remember Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Amen. And so... All the different words of the Bible should be allowed to have their place and bearing. And sometimes we read over certain points of history, or even in a prophecy, certain points, and we just sort of, you know, well, that's not the important part, right? But I want you to notice something in this. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, Daniel didn't put that in there without a reason, friends. And we're going to see that there's a very important reason for that later as we come back to this. Verse 3. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. 
And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver him out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Now, Daniel has a picture here, a picture of some animals. And is this the first place he's ever seen animals before? No, in chapter 7. In chapter 7, he had been given a vision whereby he saw a lion that had wings of an eagle. He saw a bear. He saw a leopard with four heads and four wings. And then he saw some kind of a nondescript beast that was so dreadful and terrible, nothing in nature could describe it. But now he's seeing something else again. He sees this ram with two horns. And one horn is higher, and the higher one came up last. He sees this rough goat with this notable horn. And this rough goat, in verse 6, it says, It came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler, or great anger, against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great. Now I want you to remember that the ram, it says, was great. But this he-goat waxes how? Very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great. Now we've seen a, a ram that was called great. There was a he-goat that was called very great. But now after these two animals collide and the horn's broken, it says there's four horns, and out of one, it says out of one of them, these four horns come up to the four winds of heaven, it says out of one of them linguistically, it, it, it has to mean out of one of the winds, came forth another horn. And it was a little horn, but yet it says it waxed exceedingly great. It's not just great, it's not very great, it's exceedingly great. And um, we'll go read now, continuing. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given unto him against the daily sacrifice by reason of the transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. If you notice in verse 11, if you have a King James Bible, the word sacrifice is italicized. And when you see a word in the King James Bible italicized, what does it mean? It means it's a supplied word by the translators to try to make more sense out of a verse that might not make as much sense without it. And sometimes the supplied words are very helpful, but again, remember, they're based upon the translators, and sometimes they are not more helpful. If you just read it with that, it says, By him the daily or the continual was taken away. This word daily is tamid. In the Hebrew, it means continual, something that's continually happening, or the continual sacrifice. And uh, it says he prospered and practiced. And then verse 13, Then I heard one saint speaking unto another saint, and said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression and desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And there was the answer. On the 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, what's happening and when? The third year of the reign of Belshazzar can be dated pretty closely to 550 B.C. 550 B.C. And... Um, what we're going to find out is that, that, that Babylon is just about finished. The kingdom of Babylon is just about finished. Nebuchadnezzar is gone. And Daniel has this vision. What he sees is what's coming up. And in the vision of Daniel 7, there was first the lion which represented what nation? Babylon. Babylon. There was the bear that represented Medo-Persia, Medo the, the, the joint kingdom, the joint alliance of the Medes and the Persians. There was the four-headed leopard beast, which represented Greece. Grecia. And then there was the nondescript of the terrible beast, which represented Rome. Rome in both pagan and papal forms. There was a little horn that came out, 
and it spake great words against the Most High, didn't it? Now we see here uh, a little bit more. And in verse 20, if we just go down to verse 20 in Daniel 8, we have an angel giving an interpretation to Daniel. And he says in verse 20, The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. So just like in chapter 7, where the Medes and Persians are brought into play, the Medes and Persians are again mentioned. And it said that this ram had two horns, and the higher horn came up last. And we know that in this alliance, the Medes were the first, and the Persians came in, but the Persians were, became more dominant in this arrangement. And so he says, The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. You know, there are people today who try to add to this prophecy or change this prophecy. They say, well, this prophecy meant the Medes and Persians in Daniel's day, but today it means Iran and Iraq, or it means something else today. But friends, we have an angel from heaven, an angel from heaven giving an interpretation. And I want to tell you, an angel from heaven giving an interpretation supersedes any interpretation any man will ever put upon this prophecy. Amen. He doesn't say that there's room for someone else or, or another power. He says, this is the kings of Media and Persia. And that's just plainly what it says. Now notice uh, as we read on verse 21. And the rough goat is the king of who? Grecia. Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And historically, we know that the power that came after the Medes and Persians was Greece, the Grecian Empire. And who was that first great king? History tells us it was Alexander the Great. No question about that. Going on, he says, Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of that nation, but not in his power. We know that when Alexander died, the kingdom was, was divided into four different segments based upon the four leading generals that, um, that served under Alexander. Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And this is how the Grecian Empire broke up. And he says um, in verse 23, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to a full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So there's going to come someone else after these kingdoms. And you remember in the prophecy that the notable horn was broken, but then there came up a, a, a little horn, and this little horn waxed exceedingly great. And this little horn represented Rome. It represented Rome. Now it speaks about the end here. Notice in verse 19 of Daniel 8. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. There's something about this prophecy or these prophecies that are going to deal with what? The end. The time of the end. Verse 26. He says, And the vision of the evening and morning which was told is true. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, and none understood it. In the eighth chapter of Daniel, he explains what this ram is. He explains about the he-goat. He explains about the little horn son. But it's interesting, he says nothing about the 2300 days, and you say, well, wait a minute. What does it mean here in verse 26 about evening and mornings? Because in Daniel 8, 14, um, where we were looking at that text earlier, it says under 2300 days in, in your Bible, but the Hebrew actually says under 2300 evening and mornings. But as we noted last week, the Bible says uh, uh, that an evening and a morning make up a day. The evening and the morning were the first day, like in creation. The evening and morning were the second day. And so when you see in, in that language the expression evening and morning, it simply means a day. And so the angel says that the vision about the evening and morning is this true. It's for the time and the end. But Daniel doesn't get an explanation. In fact, it says in verse 27 that, that when Daniel got to this point, he fainted. You know, Daniel was a great prophet, and, and, and he was a temperate man. We know that based upon Daniel chapter 1. He lived a temperate life. Daniel just didn't faint from natural causes, friends. This was just so overwhelming to him that his spirit just couldn't handle it anymore, and he fainted. And in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, 
the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, in Daniel 9, verses 1 and 2 now. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Remember, Jeremiah prophesied that Israel was going to spend, Judah actually, uh, 70 years of captivity in Babylon. And Daniel says, I was studying this, came to an understanding of this. And he did this in the first year of Ahasuerus, or the fir first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus. Now I want someone who has one of those smartphones, if you'll take it out for me. Who has, a, who has a calculator? Can someone pull out their calculator from their smartphone? I want you to perform a calculation for us. And I don't want to do this. I could put it on the screen, but I want you to do this. I want you to take uh, 2,300, 2,300, and I want you to divide it by 365. Take 2,300 years and divide it by 365, and what do you get? 6.3. About 6.3, about six and a third years. If this 2,300 evening and mornings was literal days, it's only about six and a third years total. Now, Daniel received this vision in chapter 8 during the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. But now we are historically around 12 years later. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. This is about 12 years later that this is happening. In other words, a lot more than six and a third years. This those 2,300 days couldn't have been something that was starting in Daniel's day at that point because they had already been expired by now. And Daniel doesn't even have the answer to them yet. Have you ever prayed for something, prayed for wisdom for something and you didn't get it the first day? Probably every one of us. And some of us have been praying for things that we've never gotten wisdom on yet, possibly. Listen, it's not because heaven doesn't care. It's not because heaven's unconcerned or heaven doesn't know. Daniel, no doubt, wanted to understand the evening and mornings. But 12 years went by, friends, between the giving of chapter 8 and the giving of chapter 9 before Daniel got an answer. And there's an answer in chapter 9. And it's important for us to know. Gabriel is going to return. Daniel begins to pray because he understands that, that the sins of his people, and he accounts himself as part of those people, the sins of his people have put them in Babylon. And he's praying for deliverance. He's praying for holiness. He's praying for forgiveness of sins. And in verse 20. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin, the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. What vision is he talking about? I saw at the beginning of the vision. He's talking about the vision of chapter 8. It's the last vision he's had. And he says, this, this, this Gabriel I saw at the beginning, he has been commissioned to come and touch me at about the time of the evening oblation. And yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. What does he come to give him skill and understanding about, you think? About a vision. A vision that he didn't get all the information on. In verse 23, he said, At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth that I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Consider the vision. Now, it's interesting that the, um, the Hebrew word vision is mara. And I'm just going to go ahead and I'm just going to advance this just a little bit. And we're going to look at this in just a minute or two, but I have another slide I want to show you first. Maybe it's gotten a little bit out of order here. But he's speaking about a vision. He calls it Amara. But go back to Daniel 8 and verse 1. Daniel 8, 1. Just mentally keep a bookmark here. It says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And you have here the English word vision, just like you do in chapter 9, verse 23. But it's interesting that Daniel chose specifically to use two different words for vision. 
There's two different words for vision here. And he's done that to help us to hone in on something special here. Because in Daniel 9.23, the word for vision is Mara. It's Mara. But here now in Daniel 8 and verse 1, it's Kazon. Kazon. And that word Kazon here means the whole vision. Everything that we're discussing. The whole principle of Daniel 8. But when he talks about the Mara specifically, he's talking about the 2300 days, the evenings and mornings. The only part of the Kazon that wasn't understand was the Mara. And Daniel, he says in Daniel 8, verse 27, he says, And I, Daniel, fainted with six certain days after I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision. I was astonished at the Mara. Not the, not the whole vision as a whole, but a specific part of the vision now. He's using another term to separate it, the Mara. And in verse 23, I have here a, a chart here on this. And in verse 23, Gabriel now says to understand the Mara. So in Daniel 9, 22 and 23, an understanding of the, of the vision about the evening and mornings was, was called the Mara. And the only part of the Kazan, Daniel 8.1, that wasn't understood was this Mara. Daniel was astonished at it. And Gabriel says, I've now come to give you understanding concerning the Mara. Okay? So the things that we're going to learn now have a direct connection, you see, to Daniel 8.14, the vision of the evening and mornings. So let's look at this now. In Daniel chapter 9 again. And we'll start in verse 24 now. Okay, go back to verse 24. He says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the word, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, for he shall make it desolate even into the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate, or as the margin says, the desolator. So, going back now and looking at this chart for just a second here, we're now starting to fill in a little bit of this. He says that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Right? Now, how many days are in a week? Seven. And... Very simple mathematics tells us that 7 times 70, 70 weeks, is 490 days. But in the Bible, a prophetic day represents a year of what? Literal time. So the 70 weeks represent 490 literal years. And he gives us a starting time when that 490 years is going to happen. He says it's going to happen at the commandment that will go forth to restore and to build Jerusalem. And we can, um, we can see that very clearly uh, in, D in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, but also you can actually read the decree. The decree is actually in the Bible. It's in Ezra chapter 7, verses 11 on. And in fact, we can just read a couple of verses there of it if you want to go back to the book of Ezra. We won't read the whole decree. But it's actually written in the official language and uh, very formally done. Ezra chapter 7. Ezra 7. And starting in verse 11. Now this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace at such time. I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests, the Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. For as much as thou art sent of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Jude and Jerusalem according to the law of thy God which is in thy hand. And he goes on to say you're going to carry silver, you're going to carry gold, you're going to carry timber, you're going to take all these things. You're going to go back and you're going to rebuild Jerusalem. And we know historically this decree was given in 457 B.C. In fact, if you have a marginal reference in your Bible, it probably uh, denotes that. 
And so that started in 457 BC. 490 years later brings you down to the date of 34 AD. 34 AD, that actually should, should be AD 34, technically. Sorry about that. In the year of our Lord, 34. You have something happening now. You have a, 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 a 70th week because there's 69 weeks. If you go back to Daniel 9, we should go back to Daniel 9. I'm sorry for not telling you to hold your place. Here we go. In Daniel 9, notice the, the language that it's, it's given here. He says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. But then he says in verse 25 that from this going forth to, uh, to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. Now, seven, three score, and two. We don't use the term score a lot anymore, but how much was a score? Remember Abraham Lincoln said four score and seven years ago? A score represents 20 years. So three score is 60 years. So you have seven, 60, and two makes the total of how much altogether? It makes 69. And so I'm going to scoot down here a little bit more with another chart. So you have 69 weeks of years, or 483 literal years, that are given. And from 457, 483 years brings us down to 27 AD, in the year of our Lord, 27. And, and that was the time, at that point, was when Christ was baptized. Mm -hmm. And you can read about his anointing in Mark 1.15, Matthew 3.13-15, Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time was come. Paul says in Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time was come. There was a time that Christ was supposed to come. An exact time. But it says that in the midst of the week, he would be cut off. Um, and in fact, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Another translation says, 70 weeks have been divided concerning thy people and concerning the holy city. The, the Hebrew word determined means literally to be cut off from, or divided, or taken off from. And what was it cut off from? It was cut off of these, the whole 2300-day prophecy. Now again, the 70 weeks uh, are 490 years. The seven weeks, three score and two weeks, or 483 years, one week equals a uh, seven years of literal time. And the time was, was to begin with the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And we read about that in Ezra 7 some. Uh, the entire copy of the decree which restored the right of government and the temple services is found there. And the, uh, this happened in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, and that was in 457 B.C., a date carried in the margins of many Bibles. And this is the starting date of the Mara. Now the time to the Messiah was to be 69 weeks according to Daniel 9.25. And if you take, just advancing our chart a little bit more, if you take 457 and go up 483, you come to the year um, AD 27. And that, that may not seem to add up right, but you have to understand that on the chronological timeline, it's not quite like a timeline of integers. When you're making a, a timeline in mathematics, the first set of numbers you ever learn about are called the counting numbers. You know, you count with them. One, two, we even use our fingers, right? One, two, three, four. The next group you, you, you learn are called the whole numbers. And they include the counting numbers plus the unit zero. And then you learn about the integers. And what do the integers have that the whole numbers don't have? They have their opposites. The negative numbers like negative 1, negative 2. And we think about the negative numbers like being the time before Christ, the positive numbers after Christ. But the thing you've got to keep in mind is that on the chronological timeline, there's no zero year. There's no zero year. You go right from minus 1 B.C. to plus 1 A.D. Okay? And so that makes it all work out. And so at, in 70 A.D., I'm sorry, in 27 A.D., Christ was baptized. But there was a 70th week left. A 70th week left. Now, many Protestant evangelicals today who believe in, in a concept called dispensationalism and who believe that there's a, something called a secret rapture that's going to occur, they, they agree with this prophecy up to this point. Many of those people agree with this prophecy to the point of the 69th week. But then they say the prophetic clock of God stopped ticking. They don't say why. They don't give any evidence why. But they say it stopped ticking. And they move that last week into the future. And the part that actually speaks about Jesus 
and the Messiah they attribute to the Antichrist. And that's so sad. Because it doesn't need to be. It all fits just like it is. Um, now, Jesus was anointed of God in John 1. Let's just read some text here. Verse 40 and 41. It says, One of the two which heard John speak followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which being interpreted the Christ. Um, the Christ, Christ or Messiah, meant anointed one, one that was anointed. So how was Christ anointed in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38? Peter says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. You remember in ancient times, if a prophet was going to anoint a man to be king, he would take a horn of oil and he would pour the oil upon his head as he would pray for this man. And so you, you have now become the anointed of the Lord. And the oil represented receiving the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And when especially was Jesus anointed with the Holy Spirit? Luke chapter 3, verse 21 22. He says, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee. I am well pleased. And so at the baptism of Christ, he especially received the Holy Spirit. He was especially anointed of God at that time. Now, according to Luke chapter 3 and verse 1, notice what it says. Again, uh, these little things sometimes may seem trivial or not important to us, or we don't see the need of putting them in. But God has a reason for everything, friends. And in Luke chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee. And then it goes on to explain about what's happening. But it's giving us a time sequence of when this baptism happened. Okay? That's the point I'm wanting to make was it was in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. And historically, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius was, that's right, 27 AD. 27 AD. And so that's when Jesus was baptized. We know that. And in Mark chapter 1, he says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And now notice verse 14. And now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. What did he mean when he said the time is fulfilled? The same thing that Paul was speaking about as we made reference in Galatians 4.4. 4, when the fullness of time was come. There was a time that was... I'm sorry. There was a time when Jesus was going to appear and start preaching the gospel. And that time was 27. 27 AD. That was Mark 1 verses 1 and 14 and 15. Anyone can add these notes later if you want them. I have all these slides and notes there for you too. Jesus knew of this time and announced his gospel as a fulfillment of Daniel 9.25. But it said that in the midst of the week, the Messiah would be cut off. So the 70th week would extend from 27 AD to 34 AD. But in the middle of that week, the Messiah would be cut off or killed. And historically, we know that Jesus began his ministry, his baptism, was in the autumn or the fall of 27 AD. Three and a half years later would bring us to the spring of 31 A.D. And that's when Christ was crucified or he was cut off in the midst of the week. The Jewish people had another three and a half years extended to them with which to, to accept the gospel message before they were formally rejected. And that was when Stephen was stoned in 34 A.D. Now, the sacrifices, he says, that the sacrifices and the oblations were to cease at this point. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 51, Matthew 27, 51, uh, Jesus has just died. He has just given up the ghost. And in verse 51, it says, Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Now, the veil of the temple was a massive curtain by itself weighing over a ton at that time. 
something that no human hand, it was, it was thick, heavy material, something no human hands could have ever torn, friends. Not only that, it wasn't torn from the bottom up. This, 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 this veil was quite high. You have to understand, in, in, in Herod's temple, the, 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 uh, the, the apartments were very tall. They weren't just like this one. They were very tall. And the only way that a human being could even try to rip it would be from the bottom up. But it says it was rent from the top down, indicating it was done supernaturally. God was saying there's an end to all of these sacrifices, and they're now because... The type has met antitype. The Son of God has now died. And you can be free from your sins and have straight access to God without priests and mediators anymore. When Stephen was stoned, the persecution of the church began in earnest. And this violence sent the church everywhere preaching the gospel, according to Acts chapter 8. And at this point, Paul, who was going to be the apostle, of the Gentiles was converted. Now I just want to finish a little bit more here today, and I, I don't have time to go into all these details, um, but I think that we looked at the, uh, the the ministry of Jesus, and if you want some some historical evidence with the Bible, the time period of his ministry. Uh, the Bible records the Passover as Jesus attended after being baptized. And beginning his public ministry, you have uh, John 2.13, John 5.1, John 6.4, and John 13.1. Those references are all to Passovers that Jesus participated or was at. See, So if you go from the fall of 27 AD to the spring of 31 AD, there would be four Passovers there. And so we had the record of those four. So we know that Jesus had... Uh, a ministry of three and a half years. I mentioned the year-day principle, and I'm just going to tell you that these slides will be available. I'll, I will leave this up here for a minute. But let's just think a little bit more about what's going to happen now to finish this 2,300 days, because that's what we started with, wasn't it? 2,300 days. There was going to be 490 years taken out. 70 weeks are determined upon that people are cut off. The first 70 weeks that were cut off go down over here from 457 to 34. That's 490 years. But if you take 490 years from 2300 years, you still have 1810 years left after the close of Jewish probation 34 AD. If you add that 1810 years, you come down to 1844. And the reason that the students of the Bible specifically picked October 22 is because that was the year that the Jewish Day of Atonement was occurring that year. Because this was to be the Day of Judgment. Remember we said that the Day of Atonement was a Day of Judgment. It was the day of the, when the sanctuary was to be cleansed. And so sometime after this 2300 days, the sanctuary would be cleansed. And so we see that it began to be cleansed in 1844. There's an investigative judgment there that is depicted. And... Um, so you have this, this, this final 1810 year period bringing you to 1844 and all these different references give the evidences of the Messiah was to be cut off in Daniel 9.26, Isaiah 53.5, he was wounded for our transgressions, 1 Peter 2.24, he bare our sins, Luke 23.33, they crucified him, uh, Daniel 9.27, he caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease, Luke 23.45, the veil in the temple was rent, he was crucified in the midst of that 70th week, um, you have probation for the Jewish nation closing in 34 AD, uh, Acts 18.6, 13.45 through uh, 46, Paul saying, you know, we're going to take the gospel now to the Gentiles, seeing you've judged yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, we will go to the Gentiles. And then in Daniel uh, chapter 7, we have the judgment hour set in Daniel. Let's go back to Daniel 7 and just read a couple verses there. And, and what you will find is, as, as you study through Daniel 2, Daniel 7, 8 and 9, and Daniel 11. You're going to see four prophecies that are parallel prophecies. Don't forget that there are four parallel prophecies. And they don't change the basic sequence of what happens. There's just different viewpoints, different angles, and different details. Okay? But in Daniel chapter 7, where some of this starts... 
actually it starts in Daniel 2, but as far as bringing you up to the beast and all, you have here stated after uh, he sees some of those things, Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, starts a new line of thought. He says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, the ancient of days did sit. And when it says thrones were cast down, the Hebrew says they were placed. Thrones were placed. They were, or set up. In fact, the thrones, most of those people said in those days, what they called thrones or seats, they were cushions. They were cushions. The cushions were placed. And the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. If you don't believe that, read Ezekiel chapter 1. Now, who is this ancient of days? It is God the Father. And verse 10, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. There's a judgment setting. The books were open. And now notice he says in verse 11, And behold, then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flames. And as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominions taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and times. But then he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient days, and they brought him near before him. After these beasts come and go in Daniel 7, parallel, paralleling the time of the beasts in Daniel 8, a judgment begins. And just after the beasts in Daniel 8, a judgment scene begins. In Daniel 7, we see into the throne room, as it were. In Daniel 8, we're given the timing of when this is going to happen, when it's going to occur. Now, judgment. This judgment, in fact, if we read on in verse um, 14, he says, And there was given unto him, unto the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Christ. It's Christ. And there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And then if you go down to verse 22, he says, um, well, in verse 21, he says, I behold the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. We know that there's a horn here, and this horn represents the papal power. But he says, until the ancient of days came and judgment was given unto the saints of the Most High, and the time came unto the, that the saints possessed the kingdom. And here in verse 22, when it says judgment was given to the saints, it could probably be just as accurately translated, or perhaps even better translated, judgment was given in favor of the saints. Judgment was given in favor of the saints. God's going to have saints for your friends at the end time, and we can be a part of those people who can be a part of that kingdom, who are going to be a part of the people that pass the judgment. And how shall we be a part of that people? How shall we be a part of that kingdom? In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12, he defines or describes these people just a little more. Revelation 14 and verse 12. He says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the, that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now the verb keep means to guard, to protect. And it's used, it has two different objects in this verse. One object is the commandments of God, but the other is what? The faith of Jesus. These people, they keep, they guard, they protect the commandments of God, and they guard the faith of Jesus. And we can be a part of that group. They have both the faith of Jesus and they have obedience in their lives. They have faith and they have works. They have a balanced program, friends. They have a faith that works by love and purifies the soul. In Revelation chapter 3, and verse 5, Jesus speaking here to the church at Sardis. He says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. If we don't want our names, friends, to be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life, then we need to be overcomers. Amen. While we are saved by grace through faith, friends, we are saved to service. You know, we quote Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, not of works, least any man should boast, right? But we sometimes leave off verse 10. Because verse 10 says, For, for you are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. See? See, we're saved by grace for good works. 
And James says, the proof that I have faith is that I have works in my life, that I'm obedient to God's commandments. And uh, he will not blot our name out of the book of life. Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the, what? Second death. death. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15. Revelation 20 and verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Friends, we're either going to be written in God's book of life or not. And this prophecy of this judgment is part of what it is all about. This helps us to understand, friends, that we are living, this generation, we are living in the time of the judgment. Now, this has been happening since 1844, and it's going to close soon when probation closes. This, this will be over when probation closes. Soon after that, Jesus comes to take his own back because he says, my reward is with me. He's going to have it all figured out before he comes. And we can be ready. We can be ready. In Revelation chapter 12, in verse 11, Speaking of those who are faithful, it says they overcame him, that is the dragon, Satan. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Friends, do you think obedience is important? I dare, I dare you to tell any martyr when you get to heaven, anyone who died for Jesus, that obedience is not important because every one of those people who died for Jesus, they died because they thought obedience was important. If obedience was important, they didn't need to die. They could compromise. They could change their faith. But because they wouldn't compromise, they wouldn't change their faith because they believed that being obedient to Christ was important. They gave their lives. They gave their lives. We are to wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb, friends. We must be willing to follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes. Beloved, in this momentous prophecy of Daniel 8 and 9, we have portrayed before us the twofold work of Jesus the first section of the prophecy, we have revealed the time when Jesus would come to offer himself as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. In the second part, we find his work as our high priest in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the final work of atonement so that we could be not only forgiven, but cleansed from all of our sins. But before the sanctuary, friends, in heaven is cleansed, our lives, the living temple, as it were, must be cleansed on earth. It's the only way. I'd like to end with a few statements that I found that I thought were helpful to me. This first one is from the book Early Writings, page 253. As Jesus died on Calvary, he cried, It is finished. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. This was to show that the services of the earthly sanctuary were forever finished and that God would no more meet with the priests in their earthly temple to accept their sacrifices. The blood of Jesus was then shed, which was to be offered by himself in the heavenly sanctuary. As the priest entered the most holy place once a year to cleanse the earthly sanctuary, so Jesus entered the most holy of the heavenly at the end of the 2300 days of Daniel 8 in 1844 to make a final atonement for all who could be benefited by his mediation, and thus to cleanse the sanctuary. And in the book Prophets and Kings, page 358, In the final atonement, the sins of the truly penitent are to be blotted from the records of heaven, no more to be remembered or come into mind. So in the type, they were borne away into the wilderness, forever separated from the congregation. And I have one more statement. When Christ the mediator burst the bands of the tomb, and ascended on high to minister for man. He first entered the holy place, where by virtue of his own sacrifice, he made an offering for the sins of man. With intercession and pleadings, he presented before God the prayers and repentance and faith of his people, purified by the incense of his own merits. He next entered the most holy place to make an atonement for the sins of the people and to cleanse the sanctuary. His work a high priest completes the divine plan of redemption by making the final atonement for sin. And friends, today we are living in that time when we can participate with Christ in the final atonement for sins. Jesus is going to come back soon. The Bible says he's coming back the second time without sin unto salvation. How will we stand in that great day? Can we stand alone in our filthiness of our rags and sin? Or will we stand with Christ beside us in the right white robe of his pure, perfect righteousness? I'm so glad. I'm so glad that theologically I'm Armenian. 
Do you know what I mean when I say I'm an Armenian? I'm so glad theologically. It means I believe in free choice. It means that I believe that God just hasn't predestinated me to either be saved or lost. And oh my, what if I've been predestined to be lost? I can't do anything about it no matter how hard I believe, no matter how hard I try, no matter how much I want to love God, I can't love Him in the end. I'm going to be lost and burned in hell forever according to those theologians. theologians. I don't believe like that. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says, choose you this day whom you'll serve. The Bible says, whosoever will, let him drink of the water of life freely. That's what the Bible is saying to you today. And you can participate with Christ. You can be a part of finishing the final atonement. And we can have a part of hastening the coming of the Lord as we bring our lives into line. And, and, and we don't have to be responsible friends any longer for the, all the tragedies that happen in the world. And there's a lot. It's not he that delays. He that shall come will come and will not tarry. It's we who delay. And so friends, he wants to come. He wants to come soon. And may we each one purpose in our hearts to follow him fully. Thank you very much, and may God bless you lots and lots.